So I think I alluded to this problem as we were finishing up last time. Uh, definitely a conservation problem whenever we're told to, to neglect friction or negligible friction, zero friction. We should start thinking about uh, conservation. We don't have a friction force to deal with. Other ways that they might de 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 define that is that this um, ring or collar slides down a smooth shaft. Uh, that, that's a, uh, another way, you know, maybe polished chrome or something like that. But uh, anyway, what our scenario is, is we have this slider up here. Uh, maybe we're taking a hockey puck or something, cut a hole in it and put it on this uh, wire or this shaft. And uh, we also have this spring that's stretched out that's anchored at this point over here. And I think you could imagine that if you were holding this up uh, weight, which is six pounds up here, and then you let it go and there's no friction, it's going to start to drop and that spring is going to pull it around that corner and have it zip by point B. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to find the velocity as it goes past point B. Some uh, geometry here that this uh, radius of this corner, and this is really not drawn very well, but this is really just a quarter of a circle here. The radius is 24 inches, and then this distance from, from where that radius would be taken over to here is 24 inches. We're told then that the unstretched length of the spring is 24 inches, so at the uh, point A up here, if you will, that is going to be stretched, what, uh, an additional 24 inches beyond its unstretched length of 24, because it's 48 inches total. Uh, we're told then also that this plane up here, if we were to take that as our reference, is 24 inches above point B. We're told the uh, spring stif stiffness, the, or the spring coefficient, is 2 pounds per inch. And uh, probably units will be one of the, uh, the bigger challenges in this problem. So if we uh, go through this, let's see what we, uh, we come up with. I'm going to go ahead, like I said, and take uh, point A up here. I'll go ahead and take uh, this as point B down there. So I can talk about then the kinetic energy at A plus the potential energy at A plus the spring energy at A is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at B plus the potential energy at B plus the spring energy at B. Okay. The, uh, let's see, you want to take, uh, where do you want to take the reference? You want to take the reference down here? We could say that this is our reference, that H is equal to zero at that point. So if we do that and, and we look at this, if, if it's resting up here, we know the kinetic energy at A is equal to zero, right? We also know as it's down here at B that it has no more potential. So it's going to, so the potential energy at B would be equal to zero. So now let's see if this makes sense. We're converting our potential energy up here and our spring energy. We have some height above the reference up here. So we've got potential energy. We've got the uh, spring stretched out. So we have spring energy. And we're going to convert those into kinetic energy at B plus this thing's probably still got some stretch and it still has some spring energy, right? So I think that's what we've got. We're converting those potentials uh, to kinetic and still some spring energy. So let's see if we can go through this. I will have, maybe I'll move this thing down here a little bit. I'm going to then have zero plus what's the uh, potential energy at A? Potential energy, what's, what is potential energy? Vg is mgh, right? So I'm going to have 6 pounds times the uh, height, which is what, 24 inches? Is that how we want to do that? <coughs> okay, so, and if I put the units below it, maybe that's worth doing. I'm going to have pounds and inches, pound inches. That's okay, but I'm going to have to be careful with it because it's not probably not that standard. So then, what about the elastic energy at A? The spring stretch, I mean, in general, what's elastic energy? B E is one half K X squared, is that right? So what do I have to put there? One half times two times how far have we stretched it? It's unstretched is 24, so if it was unstretched it would be sitting like this, wouldn't it? 
So we stretched an additional 24. Okay. Now let's see if I take care of, care of the units there. That uh, two is pounds per inch, and the 24 is going to be inches squared. So I get to cancel that. So I've got pound inches. So I think we're okay on units so far. Now let's see. Uh, what is kinetic energy? Maybe I'll stick that over here. T is equal to the kinetic energy, which is one half m v squared. Is that right? Okay, so we put that in here. What are we going to have then at b? One half. And then what are we going to have to do? The mass is six. And what do I have to do with that? Divide by 32.2. Is that, is that going to do it? Probably not. I think I'm going to have a 12 in there because if I look at the units on this, I would have uh, 6 pounds and then 32.2 is feet per second squared. So I'm going to have to put uh, 12 inches in a foot. Yeah. I think that would be okay. And then we've still got the velocity term, don't we? Our velocity at B squared. And then the last thing I do is I've got the spring energy uh, at B. What kind of spring energy do we have there? Well, what distance is this? Let's see if that's 24 and this is 24, right? This is going to be 24 times the square root of 2. All right, basic 45. So if I take the uh, 24 times the square root of 2, that's the total stretch. And then I subtract off the initial unstretched length of 24. That gives me 9.94 inches. Okay. So I can say that this is one half kx squared, so I'd have one half times two times that 9.94 squared. And that again would be pound inch, pounds over inches and then inches squared. So it's definitely worth keeping track of the units. Maybe I should have put the units up in the calculation. That would be fine. Um, but I think without a, a, a careful accounting of the units, we would have been tempted to leave off that 12 there. Another way would have been to convert everything just into pounds and inches, and that's, that would be fine too. So as you go through that, if you run through the calculation, our velocity at uh, B turns out to be equal to uh, 283 inches Per second, 283 inches per second. I forgot to bring my calculator in, or I could convert that to uh, feet per second, but there's nothing wrong with that. I guess I need to uh, say that's the velocity of B. So in these balance problems, as long as you get over the first hurdle, making sure that you don't have any friction forces or non-conservative forces, and then the second one is just units. Yes. Uh, so when we uh, well, the uh, potential, we had mg, which is w, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's only where then when I had m, that's a problem. That's going to be w divided by the acceleration of gravity g. So yeah, that's a good question. How how why we had to do it in one place and not the other? Remember, if you have the uh, metric system, it's probably going to be the other way around. Other questions? Okay. Let's try another problem. <coughs> So in this problem, we've got some sort of a uh, pendulum. And actually, as far as a device to convert uh, potential energy to kinetic energy, a pendulum is pretty good, isn't it? 
And if you look at a pendulum going through its swing, it, at the top of its swing, it has connect, or potential energy. At the bottom of its swing, if you take that as the reference, it only has kinetic energy, right? Well, we'll choose to spice up this pendulum a little bit. And what we've got here is that it's on a, a five-foot lead. And uh, then as it, uh, and we'll presumably hold it up here at this point and then release it at A. And when it gets to a 30-degree angle from the horizontal, it's going to just touch that pin. Okay? Just touch that pin. And then uh, you could imagine this is a little bit like tetherball here. It starts to wrap around uh, that pin. I'll say the pin is of negligible, negligible dimension. It'll start to wrap around that pin, and that's uh, point C. So it goes from A, us holding it up here horizontally, to B, just barely touching that pin, and then to C, wrapping around it. What we'd like to do is we'd like to find the velocity at B, we'd like to find the velocity at C, and the, the velocity at C is of course going to be like this, right? And then also the tension at C, that should be kind of interesting to see how much uh, tension is in that core. Well, is this a, a conservative problem? Can I use uh, conservation of energy? Neglect friction, we'll neglect air drag, the friction in the cord and whatnot. I think we should be good, right? So what if I look at the uh, the first case, I could say that uh, uh, there's no spring. We're going to assume this cord is constant length. So we don't have to worry about spring energy. So we could say VGA, no, not VG, I want VE. Uh, three pounds. So I'm going to say that uh, VEA is equal to VEB is equal to VEC, for that matter, is equal to zero. We don't have any springs in here. We don't have to worry about that. Okay? That's an eight pound ball. Uh, eight, three, sorry. Three pounds. Three pounds. Okay, so I could say that uh, the kinetic energy at A plus the potential energy at A, VGA, is going to be equal to the kinetic energy at B plus the potential energy at B. And I think I'll go ahead and just take this as my reference up here. Okay. So I'm going to take everything below that, which is fine. We come up with some negative numbers, that's fine. We, we, part of the reason for doing that is just to do it differently than the last problem. So I'm going to say at this point, H is equal to uh, zero. So with that, if I look at A, we're holding it at rest. So what's the kinetic energy there? Zero. Plus, what's the potential energy? If this is our reference, h is equal to zero, that has to be equal to zero, doesn't it? So then I can say that the kinetic energy at B, or what was our, uh, in general, the kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, is that right? And uh, vg is mgh. Those are our general equations. So what are we going to have here at B? One-half times 3 divided by 32.2. So I had to take those pounds and divide by 32.2 to convert that to mass. I'll deal with uh, feet, so I don't have to mess with the 12 like the last problem. And I can then talk about the velocity at b squared, so 1 half mv squared. And then I'm going to add to it, what's our potential energy at b? Well, if I look at a diagram of this thing, what are we going to have over here? If I've got the pin right here, the pivot point right here, I kind of messed that up. But this distance here is 5 feet, and this is 30. So if I look at this distance here, what am I going to have? 5 times the sine of 30. 
which is two and a half feet. So that's how far it's dropped down. So I will say that this is three pounds. That's mg. And then the h is going to be what? Negative two and a half. Because it's dropped down. Okay, so if I go through this, the velocity of b turns out to be equal to 12.7 feet per second, because we're in feet and pounds. Questions of that so far? Now I want to go ahead and I want to look at uh, C. So I, I have two options here. We could go from A to C if we wanted to, or we could go from B to C. What do you think? I mean, B to C seems like maybe the logical progression. We've gone from A to, to B, so we could go from B to C. There would be nothing wrong with that. What might be one of the arguments for going from A to C? What's that? Zero's on the left side. That's, zero's on the left side is kind of nice, for sure. What would be another argument? Yeah. If I made a mess of B and it's a multiple choice test or something, it'd be kind of nice not to have that carry over, wouldn't it? Uh, so with those two reasons, there's be, be nothing wrong with B to C, and I'll leave that for you to uh, check out. I think I'm going to go from A to C. So again, I'm going to say uh, T sub A plus V G A is equal to now T sub C plus V G C. So I have again zero plus zero is equal to at C, we're going to have a one-half times this again, 3 divided by 32.2. Its uh, mass has not changed. Um, the velocity of C squared. And then plus, we've still got the same uh, weight. There's 3. And now the uh, distance here. That gets a little more complicated, doesn't it? What am I going to have with that? Well, if I come down here and I look at this triangle, looking at that triangle there, I have, there's the pin, and I have uh, three feet here, so this distance is going to be what? Three sine 30? And then how much is the uh, that distance going to be? This, Or to ask the question, how much is that distance? That'll be 2, won't it? Okay. So I'm going to have a um, distance of 3 sine 30 plus 2. And this would have to be negative. Okay. Negative because it's going down. Does this make sense? I didn't make a big deal of this up here, but this is a positive number here and a negative number. This, again, is a positive number, and this is a negative number, isn't it? Okay, this is not subtraction. It's negative. We're multiplying by a negative number. If we chose to take our reference down here, right, we would have expected to have a positive potential here. We would just move that to the other side, wouldn't we? So you can start to see, as long as you're consistent in your reference, it really doesn't matter where you take it. You can even have a moving reference, but that makes life a lot more difficult in terms of having proper equations. You come up with a, a V sub C. I think that's uh, 15 feet per second. We run the numbers on that. Okay. And if, like, like I say, if you go from B to C, you'd have exactly the same answer. You should have the same answer. I'm going to grab another piece of paper here. So we need to, this will be what, uh, 2.1. So with that, I'd like to find the tension at C. So the tension at C. So 
So what do we have at, uh, at C? Is it uh, is wrapped around that uh, pin? And we have that uh, three pounds. And it has some velocity of C. We could really model that uh, kind of like a, a normal and tangential acceleration, right? So if I draw the free body diagram for this, We've got some tension here that I don't necessarily know. I've got then the uh, weight, three pounds, acting down. And do we have some uh, acceleration? Yeah, absolutely. Some acceleration in the normal direction. V squared over rho, right? Okay. Now, before we get too much further, if this was the static case, for the static case, we'd expect the tension to be what, three pounds? For the case where we're trying to pull this thing around this curve, we'd expect the tension to be what? Greater than. Yeah, so we should be looking at T greater than 3 pounds. Well, let's see how that works. So if I go ahead and take a positive up, summing the forces in the vertical direction, setting so to mass times acceleration in the vertical direction, which happens to be our normal direction, I will have T minus 3 is equal to the mass, which is 3 divided by 32.2 times the acceleration, which is going to be V sub C squared divided by the radius of curvature rho, right? And the acceleration is positive because it's pointing up. The only thing that I have to do is I, I have to make my substitutions. So I could say then, changing the picture on you here, I would have T minus 3 is equal to 3 divided by 32.2 times, what was our velocity of C? Wasn't that 15 feet per second? So I can just square it, and then I divide by the radius of curvature. What's that? It's really like it's pivoting about this point here where this is 2 again, isn't it? So that's 2. So we can solve for T, which is 13.5 pounds, which, yeah, is greater than 3. That's what we would expect. It was less than 3. I'd want to go back and look at my numbers. Questions with that? So just some good uh, conservation numbers or problems. The last problem I have, and we'll spend quite a bit of time on this because this brings up some, some important subjects that we don't want to leave this um, material without talking about. But this is a very classic problem of the, the roller coaster. Maybe you've been on, on one of these on amusement rides or whatnot. And um, you're one of these happy candidates here at A on the roller coaster, and you're going to do this loop-de-loop uh, -loop here, and you're going to come out the other side. So at A, you, you move through this loop-de-loop. -loop. Hopefully it makes it through at B, and then back here to C. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to find the minimum velocity at A. So what's the minimum velocity at point A to just make it past B? You could imagine if you're going too slow at A, you're not going to make it, right? Okay, so let's see how this works out. Uh, I think to do this, I'm going to do a free body diagram at B. So that's right up here at the top. And uh, what would that look like? I've got that track there, and I would have the uh, car here. And... You can draw stick men upside down or stick people upside down. Okay, so what forces do we have on this thing? Their weight. I think you'd agree that we still have the weight, mg, maybe less lunch, but uh, we still have the weight. Okay. How about the normal force? Well, that's really the definition of just making it past B, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you were to make some, uh, you know, video that you're going to post online, you know, d you know, doing some sort of crazy stunt, your your uh, your colleagues in this, they'd say, "Oh, you just barely made it because I, I saw daylight between you and the track, right?" Okay. So as this normal force goes to zero at the point where it's zero, we know that's the criteria for just making it. Okay, you just almost came off the track at that point. N is equal to zero. 
Let's see, do we have some uh, normal acceleration? Yeah, we actually do. Acceleration in the normal direction, v squared over rho, isn't it? Okay. Well, that free body diagram usually causes people lots of problems. All the forces, the acceleration, are all in the same direction. So if that's concerning to you, we're going to have some more words on that before we get uh, finished with this problem, but I think that is a correct free body diagram for now. Well, let's uh, go from uh, point A to B. And if I do that, uh, we're going to assume that uh, there's no uh, spring energy, that the track's not deforming, that the wheels are not deforming. And I could say that the kinetic energy at A plus the potential energy at A is equal to the kinetic energy at B plus the potential energy at B. Okay. And where should I take my reference on this thing? What if I take this at the reference down here? Where we start. Okay. H is equal to zero. You can take it anywhere you want. It's probably probably easy there. So that means I would have zero potential energy there. Now is this like a pendulum where I'm converting my all of my kinetic energy into all potential energy? No, I still have both kinetic and potential, don't I? I certainly have potential. We've increased our height. Could I say that this was zero? Better not be. I still have to have some velocity to make this happen, right? Okay, so I, th I think I'm okay there. So I could say that I have one half m v a squared. So I got v a. One half m v a squared is equal to. What are we going to have over here? One half m v b squared, right? Plus m g, whatever the weight of the uh, cars and the passenger is, passengers are, and then the uh, height m g h, right? I'm using that height right there. Okay. Now let's see. I need uh, this is what I'm looking for, so that doesn't concern me having an unknown there. Everything's got a mass in it, so that's good. I can cancel that out. Presumably I have no h. We send the civil engineers out there and measure that for us. We've got g. So if I could get rid of this, I need to make a substitution for the velocity of b, don't I? So let me come back down to this free body diagram here. And let me sum forces. Some of the forces in the normal direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the normal direction. So why don't I take a positive down? And when I do that, I've got mg. That's the only force I have because the normal force is equal to zero. Is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the normal direction. We said was what? V squared over rho. Which, which V is that? That's VB, isn't it? So I've got VB squared over rho. So I get to cancel the masses out of here, and I can say that VB squared is equal to rho times G. Okay, And I left it VB squared because I think I want VB squared. Now, does that make sense? What are the units on this? Let's check that. We could say uh, rho, what are we in... Uh, I don't think we're in any units. So I could say English or metric. I'll just go ahead and say uh, feet. And then G is uh, feet per second squared. So I'd have feet squared over second squared. What should uh, v, v be squared be in? Feet squared over second squared, right? So I think we're okay with this. So I could say then that I have one half the mass times the velocity at A squared is equal to one half times the mass, making my substitution for this as rho g. Rho g. Oh, we've got a little problem there. What's rho? Radius of curvature, isn't it? I mean, that would be rho. Yeah, h over 2. Maybe I'll leave that for a little bit, but we'll make that substitution at the end. So I'll say we've got rho uh, g 
We got row G. We made that substitution. Okay, plus M G H. So I get to cancel that and that and that. Multiply everything by 2. So the velocity at A squared is equal to, and multiply that by 2 by 2, I get uh, rho G plus 2 GH, or that the velocity at A is equal to the square root of rho G plus 2 GH, which maybe I could go a little bit further and say what we're going to substitute for rho, h over 2, assuming, assuming it's circular, times g plus 2 gh. So we'd come up with something like that. How do the units work in there? Feet times feet per second squared plus feet per second squared times feet. That should work, shouldn't it? Let me take the square root of that. Yeah, I think we're okay with that. So that's our minimum velocity. Again, it's not dependent on mass. Those of you that have ridden uh, this type of a ride, uh, they don't uh, demand you to give uh, the, your mass before you get on the ride. Okay. So that would be the minimum velocity at A, just to make it past that point. Now, the, the other question that sometimes comes up is, let me try and do it on this piece, what would the velocity at C be? Yeah, it'd be the velocity of A, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's pretty easy because we don't. it doesn't matter. If it's non-conservative, I can just go from there to there, right? So I could say that uh, T sub A plus V G A is equal to T sub um, or T sub C plus V G C. And if these two are zero, the kinetic energy at A and C have to equal, don't they? Yeah. Good. And that brings up the the time. I mean, it, had this taken another path, maybe it would come up here and gone something like this, would it have mattered for the A to C calculation? No, it wouldn't have. So that's the beauty of uh, using some of these work energy solutions. Well, I realize, and, and no, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. No one wants to raise their hand, but this, this free body diagram may have upset people. Okay, and one of the things is you, uh, you, you, you shouldn't say that you passed a dynamics class without being able to draw a free body diagram. And in this case, you probably ought to be able to talk intelligently about what you got here. Uh, sit down with a uh, second grader that they've filled full of uh, centrifugal force and uh, try and convince them. And maybe what we uh, want is centripetal acceleration. And I think a, a good way to start this is with, with the words centrifugal and centripetal. Uh, centrifugal is, is from the Latin, which is away from the center. Centripetal is from the Latin, which means toward the center. Okay. So if we head to our dictionary and we get that, that will probably help us as we go through this. So I'm going to repeat this free body diagram. I think that's very similar to what we uh, had on the previous page. I just put a crate there rather than a car with people, but uh, that's fine. And again, I take positive down. So I've got mg is equal to mv squared over rho. And then I, I rearrange things a little bit uh, mathematically. So I, I'm, I'm using math here. I haven't done anything wrong. mg minus mv squared over rho is equal to zero. This is what people like. Okay, They like to say that that's what? The centrifugal force, don't they? I mean, it, it really helps to describe how the water stays in a bucket when you swing the bucket around over your head, right? To have this fictitious force that's in here. And what is that fictitious force? They try and describe it as that. But where'd that come from? It's an acceleration. Okay. And you can see how, how it gets reversed around. A negative sign, that's how it's actually pointing up because we were taking positive down. Um, so, yeah, don't uh, walk away from this class or with this lecture thinking that there's a centrifugal force. There is a centripetal acceleration, that the acceleration is going towards the center. There is not a force away from the center. 
Does this work when we go the other way? Let's say that we uh, go down to one of those uh, dips in uh, high low road or wherever you test things out around here, hypothetically, of course. And we have uh, something like this where I've got my weight, that's mg. I've got the normal force here in. And do I have some acceleration? Yeah, I have acceleration. There's the acceleration in the normal direction, which is v squared over uh, rho. And this is this has some velocity, doesn't it? Here we could say that this has some velocity. Well, if I uh, look at summing the forces here, why don't I go ahead and uh, I could take this as positive down again. I would have what the normal force minus n because it's pointing up plus mg because it's pointing down is equal to the mass m times the acceleration. The acceleration is going this way so now it's what minus v squared over rho so we have to observe again the same sign convention for the forces that we do for the accelerations. So I could say then that the normal force here is equal to mg plus mv squared over rho. That's equal to n, isn't it? I mean, this is why you feel light up here, because these subtract and you get, you, at certain points, you get zero, don't you? Okay. And up here, this is why you feel heavy at the bottom of the curve, why your suspension on your car may bottom out, because they add up, don't they? Could you put the uh, centrifugal force in here? Yeah, you could if you wanted to. If you wanted to commit heresy. There it is. Okay. But it's not a centrifugal force. It's a centripetal acceleration. Leave it over here. It's an acceleration. Here it's an acceleration. Okay. So that's what they got going on, because I guess someone a long time ago decided it would be easier to describe an acceleration to a person than a force to a person. I mean, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. It'd be easier to describe a force to someone than an acceleration. But what you really have is an acceleration. Don't go down the road of trying to put this fictitious force on there, because um, while it's easier to explain, it will mess you up in other spots. Questions with that? Well, let's see. We had one other thought here. Yeah, I mean, this is how they uh, they prepare for space travel, right? I think OSU even had some students that took the uh, uh, took and uh, put experiments on this. They uh, they they get this kind. Of, they get uh, zero g's without going out into space. I mean, how do they do that? Well, what they're, they're going to do is they're going to put the uh, airplane into a great big arc like this, right? And from maybe this point to this point, maybe you got three minutes or five minutes or however long it takes them to fly that uh, course, that you're going to have zero g's. You float around inside the plane. Yes. This from that when you are in microgravity when they're floating, does that actually feel like it's falling? I don't know. I haven't been there, but I I don't think you feel anything. Because I know that people don't want the sensation of falling. Uh, yeah, I don't think you have the sensation of falling falling because you you've got no you're not falling. Questions with that? So hopefully if you were uh, unconvinced of this free body diagram here, you can look at these two pieces, whether it's this free body diagram or that free body diagram, and make those work out for yourself. Well, like I said, that's the end of our work in uh, work energy. We'll come back next time and talk about impulse and momentum. Take care till then. Thank you.